everyone for joining us on, I guess, this very unusual product tank or product meetup. Um, not sure if any of you have, have attended any online meetups um, already, but we're very keen to give this a go. Um, so I also just wanted to say, um, we do acknowledge that this is, I guess, an unusual topic right now because of, I guess, the circumstances, but we're really hoping that you get um, a lot out of what Simon and Acacia have to share, um, if not today, but that could help you in the future. Um, and as I mentioned, for those who weren't on the line earlier, if you do have a question, there is a Q&A button. If you scroll down, there's on your black bar. So if you type, if you have any questions, you can type that in there as everyone is on mute um, and you will stay on mute for the duration uh, of the sessions, but we'll have some Q&As at the end. All right, so we're going to start with Acacia Edwards. Um, and Acacia is in our bottom left. I think everyone has the same screens. So welcome, Acacia. Um, and Acacia is going to talk to us about navigating the product management career jungle gym. So how I use my non-traditional background to scale my product career. And I believe that non-traditional um, background is fashion, PR and marketing. Yeah, fa uh, fashion PR. Yeah, so Perfect. different start, but great ending. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, Acacia, we're very interested to hear, um, I guess, how, you know, how you've experienced um, product management in your career. And um, Acacia also heads up the Extensibility Product Group at Zendesk. Um, and is very passionate about developing future product leaders. So with that, I'll pass on to Acacia. Awesome, thanks so much, Emily. I'll just share my screen. All right, can we see some yes. orange slides there? All right, hello. Um, my name is Akasha, and I'm here to share seven lessons that have helped me to forge a career in product management. Um, so three things to know about me. I'm the group product manager at Zendesk, I'm a crazy dog lady. Um, these are my dogs, Otis and Daisy, they're rescue pups. And I never planned on becoming a product manager. But by the grace of having big things go wrong and following my curiosity over a career path, I now have this cool job at a great company where I get to grow products and product managers. And I understand that it's, it's a really different time right now and a lot of you are looking to break into product management. So I'm hoping that by sharing my non-traditional career path and some of the lessons that I've learned along the way, it might help you too. I grew up in a really small beach town. Um, my dad is a social worker and my mom is a massage therapist and it was an arty and sexual hippie household. We didn't have a lot of money, but then again, no one else in the town did either. In high school, I didn't have very many examples of successful career paths. Um, we saw teachers and police officers do reasonably well. Um, so that's what one of my, a lot of my classmates went on to do. Um, but I loved magazines like Vanity Fair, Vogue. They were my gateway to this sophisticated world away from a small town. And I loved writing. So my dream was to work for a magazine in the city. So when I was 18, like most people, I moved out of home to attend university I'd go to classes on journalism, sociology, law, creative writing, and digital media. And it was in those journalism and digital media classes that I learned about the rapid decline of the magazine publishing industry. My career aspirations were essentially dead on arrival. So I encountered my first lesson that has served me well throughout my product career, which is adaptability. My career plan had to change. But not before I spent a few tragic months crying on my way to my many bartending jobs at the time. But soon I connected the dots between my writing skills and the rise of blogger culture into a career as a fashion publicist. And it was so much fun. You pretty much just had to attend events and then write about them the next day or that same night if you didn't have too many champagnes. But after a year or so, I got bored. Um, the whole industry seemed a little bit vacuous to me. Um, so I saw an opportunity for a copywriter at a digital agency and went for it. Which brings me to my next product lesson, curiosity. My first job in digital was amazing. Um, I was working on healthcare websites, apps and software, and I really leaned into my curiosity to build my skills there. I find ways to optimize my copywriting work through templates and tools and libraries, and then spend the rest of my time pestering all of my colleagues. Um, I'd sit with the developers to understand what they did, 
I'd help out the sales team to understand how they created deals. And I pestered product designers to understand how and why they designed things the way they did. This was a really good start for my product career as I gained experience interviewing customers for their website copy and marketing, understanding their needs for apps and software, and working with design and developers to build the thing. And after about a year of working at the agency, I saw a need for what at the time was called a project manager, um, which would later be on to be called a product manager. So I just started to do the work and started talking to everyone about how my role should be a project, now product manager. And eventually I was one, um, which brings me to my next product lesson. Um, I think the lesson here is resourcefulness. And I speak to a lot of people who face the chicken and egg scenario, which I have so much empathy for because I've experienced it before, is that the job requires experience, but I need the job to get the experience. Um, and it really does feel that way. And it is that way in a lot of cases. But I think if you can be resourceful, um, whether it be building your own products on the side or coming in through an adjacent space like I did, or through the customer support team by building domain experience, you can break through into product management. This also comes down to how you tell your story as well. Through my experience in PR, I was pretty good at packaging my skills and experience in a powerful way. And I do think that storytelling is an essential product skill. But moving on, after three good years, I'd really reached my growth potential at the agency. So I decided to follow my curiosity again to find my next challenge which led me to experimentation. And you know what? It absolutely didn't work out. Um, I took a huge pay cut. I had a two hour commute each way. Um, the company culture was awful. They put me in the Brisbane River um, doing night kayaking full of bull sharks as team building. Um, and the job was so far removed from what it said on the tin and what I was naturally good at. Um, which led me to the next lesson, which is learning to fail well. I cut my losses and avoided falling into that sunk cost fallacy trap. And so I moved on quickly, taking my learnings about what I liked and what I didn't like to get a job building tech products for pharmaceutical companies. Um, and if anyone else has hippie parents, uh, you'll know that one of the best ways to disappoint them is to go work for Big Pharma. But an even better way to disappoint them is to work for Rupert Murdoch's News Corp. I was headhunted by a recruiter there soon after to work on their work lifestyle websites like Vogue, GQ and Taste. And it seemed so close to my childhood dream of working on magazines that I had to take it. But in reality, I ended up working for the mummy blogger website Kidspot and the user generated content food site Best Recipes. Which brings me to my next product lesson. Empathy. It's difficult, you know it's difficult because even the dictionary struggles to define it in a clear way. At Best Recipes, um, the key cohort had a really interesting user profile. Um, our biggest cohort was those aged over 60 years old, so non-digital natives. And what I found was that the typical product management practices like split testing, adding new features and optimizing the user experience just didn't work. I had to really gain empathy for my audience to understand that what they needed was consistency and for the product to stay the same. I couldn't work from any playbooks or best practices to satisfy the needs of this audience. So that was a great learning for me. Soon after this, I was headhunted again for a SaaS role at a startup turned scale up. And you can see the pattern here. I was a bit of a job hopper early in my career. And for me, it was a great way to rapidly scale my skills and in turn my earning potential. Um, but I understand that it's not right for, for all employees or employers. Um, but this role was a huge opportunity for me. I was the first product hire in the business as it scaled from 30 to 300 people globally in just a few years. And in those years, I grew the product team from just me to eight product managers and four product designers. And together we launched a whole new product portfolio and created a huge integrations marketplace. This is when I really learned the value of self-education. I had to be incredibly comfortable with change be okay with not having all of the answers at once and make time to research and learn new skills I needed each day as the company scaled. I also decided at this time to engage in more formalized study and obtain my MBA. It was a huge commitment. I would work full time, go to class on campus after work, then some nights come back and head back to the office to finish off assignments until 1 or 2 a.m. in the morning. It's not a path I would recommend to everyone, but I can definitely say it helped to rapidly scale my toolkit. 
particularly as I had the ability to learn something the night before and apply it straight into the workplace the next day. I think there's so much to be learned from disciplines outside of tech and product management that can make us better product managers, such as economics, psychology, law, and that's what I got for my MBA. And also in relation to self-education is the ability to learn from others. I now work at Zendesk with a whole heap of intelligent, talented people I can learn from. And I also look to and learn from some of the big names in product management. Some of them include uh, Teresa Torres for continuous discovery, Marty Kagan for solid uh, product org design, and Jason Lemkin for all things SaaS. And in my role as group product manager, I now hire and help develop other product managers. And when I hire, I look for people with these qualities and experiences. So adaptability, curiosity, resourcefulness, the ability to experiment, failing well, empathy, and self-education and interests. So these seven product lessons have really come full circle for me. Um, thank you for your time today. I hope I've been somewhat helpful sharing my story. Um, and please feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn or email. Um, I'd really love to help you along with your career. Thank you, Acacia, very much for that. Um, now, if anyone does have any questions um, for Acacia, you can drop into the Q&A. There is a box at the bottom of the webinar screen, especially for those who have just joined us. Um, everyone is on mute, so we won't be able to hear you if you do ask a question out loud. Um, but I'll have, I have a question for you, Acacia, because it's quite an interesting story and you've obviously gone through um, quite a learning and self-reflection, I guess, of really how you've managed to get into where you are. Um, so for those who, I guess, are struggling or don't have the opportunity to move around with their jobs as much as you were able to, do you have any other tips um, that some people, that someone could do if they wanted to, I guess, learn more or um, increase their skills without having that option? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one is side projects, which I, I touched on a, a little bit, whether it's following um, a passion or a hobby and building a product around that. Um, another option is there's lots of um, volunteer opportunities that you can volunteer for to get your hands on a digital project and also help out a charity at the same time. Um, I think it's really helpful if you're working in the tech space or even if your company has a website or anything that you can get your mitts onto. Um, and really start reading about product management and thinking from a product perspective and, and kind of figuring out why, what makes great products great. Excellent. Um, now we do have a question that's come through um, from David. Uh, he's asked, what are a few good failure stories you've heard in interviews? Ooh, I don't feel comfortable sharing someone else's failure story. But I'm sure <laughs> your own. <laughs> My failure story. So, one of my um, learnings, which is related to empathy early on in my product career and also just user research in general, is that we were working on an app for kids that suffered from rheumatoid arthritis in their hands. And we were building this game for the pharma company. And as part of the game, we were trying to design an app that had to be rocked and shaken by the user. What we understood when we eventually tested this after it was built is that that is the, not the thing you want a kid with sore hands doing. Um, so my learning there was to really research the thing before you build the thing. <laughs> Quite a basic concept, I guess. Yeah, right? a lot what of the times you can. Concept. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but I, we don't we don't always do it. <laughs> yeah, it's really good. Yeah, I think that's something we definitely know that we need to do more often. Um, that's it. That's a very interesting one as well. And being empathetic and understanding, I guess, of, of what the particular audience is that you're building for is experiencing. Absolutely. And not skipping steps. Like, yeah. test it. Like, <laughs> test it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Great. All right. Meg, did you have something? Yeah, I actually have a question um, just around the MBA that you did. Um, uh, I'm guessing, I guess not everyone has the time or um, capacity to do an MBA, but what, what are some of the things you can suggest in terms of people building their commercial skills um, and around, around having that business savviness that you need as a product manager? Absolutely. I think um, one of the biggest things I got from economics within, in the MBA is learning about unit economics, which is so applicable 
to product management, um, it, it is a practice that we use all the time. So understanding the metrics that run the growth and success of your business and researching the models that are applicable to your product and your market. Excellent. Um, and we've just got two more questions that have come through. We have, uh, do you have any recommendations on books and websites for product management? Yeah, absolutely. So Marty Kagan's Inspired is a really good book um, that I've found. Um, I think that Leading the Product is a really good website. Mm -hmm. um, I also like, oh, Adrian. There's, um, there's lots of um, online product training camps as well that are available that are really helpful. Excellent. Um, and then we have, hi, Acacia, thanks for sharing your experience. You spoke about skills you would look for in someone you would be hiring. Can you also please speak about professional experience you would look for someone to be selected in the digital space as a product manager? Professional yeah. experience, yeah. Um, I saw a really great talk last year about the product polygon and how there's a different set of skill sets involved in being a product manager, whether it's understanding of the technology space, the business space, user empathy and design. And I think it really matters for what role you're filling, the, the background and experience. So in a more design focused role, you might look for someone who's worked in a product design background or maybe in UX. Um, if you're searching for a technical product manager, you might be looking for someone who did a computer science degree or has an interest in engineering. Um, so it really depends on the role you're looking to fill. Wonderful. And we have one last question at the moment. What are the biggest challenges you face as a product manager? I think as a product manager, you have to be really decisive to be good at your job. And I would love to make everyone happy and I would love to satisfy everyone's needs. Um, but a big part of the job is making hard trade-offs and communicating those trade-offs to all stakeholders um, so that you can deliver a, a product on time and, and that suits market needs. So I think that's one of the biggest challenges that will always be around is the need to people please, but yeah. also not being able to. No. Um, and then we have, oh, we've got more that are coming through. <laughs> I might answer a couple more. Uh, how easy is it to transition from a business analyst role to a product manager role? I, I haven't encountered, actually, I have encountered many product managers. I think it's a pretty common path moving from business analyst to product management. Um, so yeah, I think it's fairly easy. And again, I think it's all about how you package your experience and your participation in different projects, highlighting how you collaborate with engineers, highlighting your on-site client experience, data analysis, that kind of thing. Perfect. And we have one more. Uh, thanks for the presentation. It's very insightful and inspiring. You've focused a lot on soft skills. What do you think about hard skills that are most critical for PMs or for product managers? Hard skills. Um, <laughs> is product management all soft skills? I mean, yeah. there's data analysis, but I think that that kind of um, comes with the job description. So I think um, qualitative and quantitative data analysis, I think being able to follow macro and micro environmental trends to be able to shape your product, um, being able to understand technical documentation and what the customer and business implications are. Um, but I think the great thing about being a product manager is you have so many partners to work with. So I really focus and value soft, skill, soft skills. Soft skills. <laughs> yes. Wonderful. All right. So we don't have any more cute questions coming through at the moment. If you do have anything else for Acacia, please feel free to leave them in. Oh, hold on. There's one there. <laughs> do you work a lot with product marketing managers and how do you see your roles differ? Yes, I do. At uh, Zendesk, I currently work with five amazing product marketing managers. Um, I think we are very uh, closely married, um, but product mar marketing managers really work more closely with the sales team and the market to be able to communicate what we're doing in line with the company vision and goals. Um, and product managers work on the stuff that comes before that. So what we're going to work on, why we're going to work on it. So product marketing managers really are the translators to the market. Wonderful answer. That's one that I think a lot of people get confused about, especially in how they work together. Um, oh, we've got more coming through. So 
with regards to data analytics, so this relates back to, I guess, some of the hard skills that you were, were talking about. Would you say that knowledge or skills of programming, um, for example, SQL or Python is needed? It depends what business you work on. So in Zendesk, we do need to understand SQL. Um, and I think it is valuable to learn either SQL or Python. Um, it's also valuable to try and get your mitts on Google Analytics, Pendo, any of those other product analytics tools to know how to apply instrumentation to your products as well, build reports to your key stakeholders, including your CEO. Um, so it's important to know those hard data analytics skills, but even more important are those data visualization tools and be able to tell a story with that data. Yeah, I think that's really important, especially around being able to understand the data, but being able to explain it in a way to the people who you need to explain it to. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, because that can be challenging sometimes. Um, all right, then I've got one that's, is there any certification that can help me transition to product manager role from a VA role? Unpopular opinion. Um, I don't think um, you need certifications to be able to move into a role. I really think that more hands-on experience, whether it be building your, your own product outside of office hours in your own time and demonstrating that, that passion and ability to build a product is, is much more valuable than obtaining, say, a, a Scrum certification or anything like that. But that's my personal opinion. Perfect. And then one, okay, this one goes back to a previous question that you just answered. Um, are you able to give any examples of how SQL is being used? querying tables comes to mind? Yeah, um, querying tables, understanding everything that happens within our product. Um, so understanding how many apps installations are happening on our extensibility marketplace. Um, yeah, absolutely everything. Understanding user growth, churn, uh, revenue stats. We use SQL for everything. Wonderful. All right. There's nothing else there for the moment. <laughs> so if you do have any more questions for Acacia, feel free to leave them. Oh, no, there is another one. Every time I say this, <laughs> it's very popular, Acacia. What's the mindset that I need to build when progressing from business analyst to a product manager? I think it is more um, openness. Um, from my understanding of a business analyst role, it's very focused on analysing the details, on executing perfectly. Um, whereas I think in product management, you have to be more focused on the product strategy, responding to change, adaptability, those kind of things. Wonderful. All right. Give you a second, see if I can come through. All right. I'm, I'm going to pass on to Meg, my co-host, to introduce Simon. But if you do have any more questions for Acacia, please do feel free to add them in the Q&A. We can, um, she's, she'll be able to answer them at the end of Simon's presentation and his questions. Great, thanks Emily. Um, so our next speaker, um, Silen McSorley, um, is uh, the head of Crew Talent Advisory. So Crew works with SaaS organisations and technology businesses um, that are either scaling, starting or transforming. And Simon really helps them to work out what their hiring requirements are um, and then really tries to match the best people to those requirements. So. He probably sees, I would hate to think, how many CVs a day um, and really is that first filter between you and um, some of the organisations you might want hope to work with. So looking forward to hearing Simon's tips on how we can get hired as a product manager. Thanks, Simon. Lovely. Thank you. I'm just going to share my screen and hopefully I do reasonably well. Um, let's try this one. Here we go. No, not that one. No, not that one. I can see yours. You just might need to click share on the yellow button there and it should bring it up nice and big. Oh, sorry, present, present. Yeah. Yes. I always hit the wrong one as well. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. Cool. Um, so that's contrary to popular opinion, that's not me as a child. Um, I've never been, I've never been ginger, and I've never worn a, an orange Kathmandu top. Um, but yeah, thanks for the thanks for the the intro, Meg. Um, we work with a, a wide range of, of predominantly SaaS and technology businesses to help them scale their teams um, and help them make really good hiring decisions. Um, Ninety nine percent of our hires are across technical roles, so anything from engineering, design, and predominantly product, 
Um, so you're quite right, we sort of do have a fair bit of insight in terms of um, the, 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 the challenges that people have from getting a, a job as a product manager, whether they're currently in a role and they're transitioning um, or sort of from a, from a first um, a first time product manager. Um, so I'm hoping there you can see my screen. So you know, getting a new job anytime is, is hard work. Um, you know, whether you're um, moving from, from a current role into a more senior role, but I think if you're transitioning from a role that's um, perhaps not the one that you're doing at the moment, you're trying to move into um, into a new role. And uh, going back to the, you know, the, the questions we had earlier, moving from something like a BA role into a product manager role, can be particularly challenging as well. So we'll, we'll have a talk through some of the, the things that I see and, and sort of give some advice there. Um, I think one of the things to, to bear in mind is it's a really competitive, fast-paced market. Um, Organisations are, are trying to, generally trying to hire quickly. Um, they've got operational things that they're trying to execute on. Um, as soon as a, a role gets released or budget gets approved to hire, generally there's this, this, this desire to, to get the role hired. Um, as quickly as possible. Um, and as I tell clients, it's a dynamic market. Um, pretty much any job ad you'll see as well. Talked about businesses being dynamic, quite possibly one of the, uh, the most overused words in, uh, in job seeking. Um, but here's some ideas um, from my end to, to help um, our listeners on, on their journey. Um, I think the first thing I'd say, in my experience, a lot of job seekers um, are a bit like this. Um, if you don't know who this is, this is Scrat from my favorite movie of all time, Ice Age. Um, Scrat relentlessly chases, chases the acorn um, at the beginning and throughout most of the, the, uh, the Ice Age franchise and movies. Um, and he's, he's a hilarious little thing because he doesn't really have a plan, but he's, he's always chasing this acorn that he never quite gets. Um, and in my experience, quite a few job seekers are like that. So I think probably some of the, the early advice I'd give to job seekers is track where your resume is going. Um, if you're applying for jobs on, on a job board like Seek, just run yourself a little spreadsheet of where you've applied to. If there's a contact name on that job ad, save the name, put it into a spreadsheet. Um, you know, if you're saying on your resume that you're incredibly well organized and then I phone you about a role that you've applied for and you can't remember which one it was, um, you're potentially looking like you might be contradicting yourself. So, um, so I think be really, be really planned and systematic about what you do. Um, and it doesn't help when a lot of uh, recruiters are a bit like Sid, um, nice wave there, but a lot of recruiters that you might deal with can be a bit hopeless as well. And not hopeless from a skills perspective, but quite often hopeless because they're overwhelmed with working on too many roles and dealing with a lot of candidates. Um, so I think you know, from, my, from my end, I think some, some really early advice is um, do your research and be really proactive. Um, present yourself in the best way possible. And remember that when you're, when you're applying for, for a role, you are the product. So knowing how to sell yourself and the value that you bring to a potential employer, regardless of the role you're going for, but the value that you bring um, as, a, as, a, as an employee, as a new member of the team is really, really important. So I'll jump into each of those and, and sort of describe what I mean. Um, and I think you know, the, the, the most important thing to remember as well is not to try and get the job straight away. What you're trying to do at the, the beginning is to try and get a conversation with either the chief product officer or the recruiter or whoever's hiring for the role. Um, so just try to get the conversation. You know, I think the internet has been one of the best and one of the worst things for job seekers. Um, you know, we, it's really easy to fire applications, um, but quite often, you know, we don't, I think, possibly present ourselves in the best possible way. Um, you know, things like cover letters addressed to the wrong person or to the wrong business. Um, again, if you're, if you're going to stay in your, opening salvo on your resume that your your attention to detail is second to none but you've addressed um your resume your cover letter to dave and my name's not dave it's Simon. then again potentially contradicting what you're saying so i think just the attention to detail thing is probably important um cool so if you put yourself in the scenario where you've you've made the decision that you're you're going to be going out getting a role as a as a product manager that's what you want to do um yes you can apply to, to jobs on seek my advice would be to, to do some research. You know, what are those tech businesses that you'd love to work at? Who's the head of product or the chief product officer? Or who, who's the person that the role that you want reports to? And find them. Get onto LinkedIn, find out who they are, find their email. It's not hard to find people's corporate emails now. There's 
umpteen tools that are out there that are free. If you need one, just ask me and I'll share one with you. Um, Meg, if you want to share hunter.io, um, jump onto Hunter, really simple, it's actually a really good product. Um, to put in the URL of the uh, the business that, that you're looking for, the name of the person that you're looking for in that business, and it'll, it'll go out into the web and try and find you an email address. Um, so contact them, you know, send them an email, um, and you know, really good cover letter addressed to them. Um, maybe it links to some products that you've worked on if you've already been in a product role. If you haven't been in a product role, talk about why your skill set matches potentially what they're looking for. And I'll talk, talk a little bit about how to do that as well. Um, to give you an overview and just some, um, some idea of what the market's like, this is a dashboard from uh, one of my most recent roles um, that I worked on. Um, you can see the, the four red circles, squiggles along the top. Um, 13 people that we disqualified, two that we interviewed, one was a feedback, three, 45 had applied, that was 62 applicants for one role. Getting through that many applications, um, contrary to popular belief, is really, really time consuming and really difficult. When you're wanting to give everybody an equal opportunity to get the role or, or to get the opportunity for a conversation, it's time consuming going through there. What, what can make it really easy to disqualify people, and you can see the 13 that were disqualified, when there's, there's very little context um, around the work that they've done to the role. They haven't really sold themselves. Quite often what I see in resumes is just a list of tasks that people did. They don't talk about the outcomes, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But being able to talk about the value that you bought rather than just listing the tasks that you did, I think is really important. But I just added this just to give our, our attendees a, just an understanding of this, the, the competition they might have but also how easy it actually is to stand out from the competition. Um, so again, so present yourself well. So cover letter, I don't really care if there's a cover letter. Um, if the cover letter is included and it's, um, it's just a repeat of what's in a resume, I just roll my eyes. Um, if the cover letter tells me something um, and it's personalized to me and it tells me something interesting, then it makes me want to have a look at the CV. Um, so I think your CV obviously then needs to have some relevant details um, and I think if you have a portfolio, um, whether you've been in a product manager role or not, you can still have a portfolio. So I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Oh, going forward. Um, so resume, my tips for, for resumes, um, don't just list the tasks that you've done. Um, describe the problems that you solved and the results you achieved. Um, when it comes down to it, product managers, um, no matter how you unpack it, are, are problem solvers. You know, whether you're inheriting a product that's not selling enough, whether you're inheriting a product that's um, really popular, but the, the metrics, and Akasha talked about the metrics, your metrics are just upside down or it's, it's unprofitable. People love it, but it's just not making enough money. Um, and you need to make it more profitable by extending or building out new features, whatever it is, you're a problem solver of some kind. So talk about the problems that you've solved and the results you've achieved in previous roles regardless of whether you've been a product manager or not. Um, and I think, you know, make it relevant to the requirements of the role that you're applying for. So if a position description had three dot points of things of must have skills, talk about how the work you've done relates to those skills. So again, this takes, I think, time to, to sit and think about what it is that you're saying, the story you're telling. Uh, again, going back to Akash's point about being able to tell stories. Um, this is a really good, um, formula for, for resumes. So you might say, I accomplished X, so I accomplished a metric, measured by Y, by doing Z. Um, so that might be, if you were sales, i make it really simple. Um, I accomplished 150% of my sales target, measured by $2 million, because your sales target could have been $30,000, could have been $30 million, they mean different things. I accomplished 150% of my target, measured by 100% being $2 million by contacting more customers than my, than my competitor and having a more superior product and getting more sales calls. So that might be a very simplistic metric that you use and build on that. Um, Laszlo Bock, um, Meg, if you want to share that name, Laszlo Bock, uh, Laszlo Bock is the ex-VP um, of HR for Google. This was the, um, the formula that he advised all, all their applicants to, to follow. 
Um, and, and I think he says that he's got a book um, that you can find. They'd have some, um, he'd put this in, uh, in job ads saying, you know, we want to see your resume, but use this formula to tell us what you've done. And the people who wouldn't do it or didn't, he'd sort of think, well, you obviously either you, either, you, know, you can't follow some basic instructions or, or, or you don't care, which is fine. Um, but if there wasn't this description of, of being able to describe what it is that they'd done um, and, and what they'd achieved, they, they, just, they just wouldn't spend time on their, on their resume. Um, portfolios. Um, this is um, a guy who, who we hired recently, um, had this, this portfolio. Um, and, and I love um, the, the second line there, here's most of my life's work so far. Um, this, is this is probably one of the most detailed portfolios I've ever seen. Um, and it goes into some very granular detail that Jared was, uh, was, was able to share. But you could, even if you haven't built any products yourself, if you built dummy products, if you've had ideas around products that you'd like to build, um, if you've got opinions about products on how you'd improve them, um, you could build your own portfolio and talk about what you would do. Um, in in one of uh, with one of our clients um, that we work with, one of the things we ask product managers is, you know, mentally re redesign iTunes for us. Because in iTunes, in its old state, iTunes was something that people either loved or hated. It, it divided opinion, and it had that many features that that you could actually redesign the whole chunks of it. Um, and so we we give that as as a, as a product design challenge and, and ask people to think about that, and they'd they'd go off and, and do that, and they put it into a into a portfolio for us, and then we'd, we'd sit and critique it. Um, but you could include something like that. You could include a relatively simple task to demonstrate how you think about product challenges or product problems. It can be a product that you love, but you think could be so much better. You know, what could you do with it? You could put that into a portfolio, even if you've never been a product manager before. So again, I think this is just, it's just communication of, of how you solve problems. And in, in the case of a product you love, how you would theoretically solve a problem. So again, I think, remember that you are, you are the product and you're, you're trying to get a job, you're trying to move careers. So if you are the product and you're, your product is you're a problem solver, how are you conveying that? Um, so you know, being, I think, I think that the important thing to remember is that being a, a high quality problem solver means that you have value. You know, how much value you have probably depends on the scale of the problems and the impact that your problem solution has. So if it's generating revenue that's um, way and above a product's performance, if you're going to come in more from a, um, a social, social enterprise or a public sector um, perspective, it might be that you're impacting users in a different way outside of financial metrics. Um, but what's the problem that you're solving? So. I think I don't think we, we focus on that enough. So I think you've got to remember you're the you're the product. Um, so what if you're new to, to all this? You've you've been in another job. How do you get your very yellow foot um, inside a uh, inside the door? Um, I think this is quite good. Carrying on from Akash's comments, I think these are the, these are the skills that, and the traits that are that are transferable. So problem solving we've kind of spoken about. If you have a commercial or a financial finance background and you understand finance metrics, again, this is what Akash just spoke about, um, then these are really, really transferable. Um, I think if you have an understanding, um, even if a base level understanding of the SDLC, of how development works, of how products and software gets built, um, then I think that stands you in good stead. I don't think you need to know the ins and outs of an API straight away, but um, understanding how they all interact is a, uh, is absolutely something that's worth worth knowing. Um, great comms, um, you know, being able to communicate. I think your written and verbal communication. Uh, again, um, going to Akash's point, sort of, and it's down below as well. Being able to tell stories, um, collaboration. How well you can um, you can get teams working together. It, it's funny, you know, product management. I sort of describe it to people as quite often it's a role that that manages no one but leads everyone. Um, you, know, you may not have direct reports um, as a as a product manager, but you may have product teams drawn from your design team, from your engineering team, um, and they might have their own team leads or tech leads. 
So you don't, may not necessarily have direct reports, but you lead absolutely everybody. Um, you know, they're going where you, where you need them to go, uh, where your data is telling them to go, where data is telling you to go. Um, I think having user empathy, um, I think one of the biggest things that I find is, um, you know, is, is people being able to realize that, that, that their opinion on product is irrelevant. You know, it being able to listen to users and understand what, what it is that users want. Um, so again, storytelling, and I think being able to demonstrate how you, how you learn, how you can iterate. Uh, and Akash's story is, is, is brilliant. You know, she's picked up all these, these, these complementary and transferable skills on the way to becoming the product manager she is now. And you know, she's kind of iterated her career as she's gone. So I think that's exactly what we're talking about here. Um, so, so again, so they're the transferable skills. So, so how do you communicate these things? Um, I think being able to demonstrate that you understand, even at a basic level, how product management works, even though you haven't done it as a job yet. Again, you know, we've spoken about it a little bit, but could you have a mock portfolio where you're talking through a, a product development life cycle, where you're demonstrating that you understand, even at a fundamental level, how product management works? Um, I think being able to demonstrate that you've acquired new skills and knowledge in, in the past is really, really important. Um, again, this is this learning and iteration mindset. Um, some of the best product managers I've, I've interviewed have, have, have talked about, you know, um, I moved into a new role, I knew nothing about X, Y, Z. I had to learn in a month. Um, I went on a course and now pretty much everyone comes, comes to me about this thing, which is a real pain because I wish other people knew it, but, but I had to learn it for the role. Um, I think you know, you're, you're being able to demonstrate you know, your, your affinity for people and finding solutions to the problems that they have. Um, and again, you know, some products are, are purely driven you know, financially by financial metrics, but if you're in, the, in a social enterprise or in a government sector, and I'm seeing a few government departments now taking more of a product, product sort of a approach to, to their services. Um, and so their measurements of success for that product are, are not necessarily going to be financial, but you know, regardless of where you operate, I think if you can demonstrate your affinity for, for people and finding solutions for these problems, um, then that's important. Um, I think it's important to be able to convey that. Um, and again, this question of what, what product would you fix if you could? If there was one product that you knew you could, you could fix, what would it be? You know, convey that sort of stuff. Um, and I think that this last point, then demonstrating that you understand that you, you're not your users and that your biases and preference, so preferences are irrelevant. Um, you know, we, we build for other people. I'll say you guys build for other people. Um, so you know, getting inside their head, understanding them, you know, getting in front of customers. I'm, I'm still surprised the amount of product managers that I, uh, that, I, that I speak to on the phone that very rarely get in front of customers. I might do some, some calls, but actually get in front of them, watch them use products. Um, I don't know. I don't know if it's a dying art. I just don't think enough of us do it. So there, there are my thoughts. Um, happy to take any questions. Um, if anybody wants this slide deck after, they can have it. But uh, that's, uh, that's where I am. Thank you so much. I hope that's been helpful. Awesome. Thank you, Simon. I definitely learned a lot already. And it's just amazing to see um, how much how many resumes you have coming in for just one role and you know obviously when recruiters are so busy just being able to triage those quickly and spot people who um, they think fit the role is um it's great to see that other side in some ways um we can understand our users <laughs> um, for our resumes a little bit better by talking to you so that's awesome um, we have a few um, questions in the chat, which has been great as people have been adding them throughout the talk. Um, feel free to keep adding and I'll work through them now. Um, so there's, um, there's a question here, actually, there's two that are quite related. Um, so who does the general, who generally does the head of product um, report to? Um, is it the CEO? And also have you seen head of product um, go, go into C-suite roles as well? Um, depending on the size of the business, um, with some of our larger, um, larger clients uh, that have the scale, yes, the, the CPO generally reports into, into the CEO um, and a head of products can absolutely be C-suite. Yeah. So from a career progression perspective, um, you know, again, depending on the size of businesses that, that you work in um, or that you're aspiring to work in, you can absolutely you know, go up to, to C-suite if that's what you're wanting to do. 
I've also seen there are chief product officers in the in some of the really big organizations. So it's great to see, you know, those that actually that product position coming into the C-suite as well. So yeah. that's awesome to see. Yeah. Um, okay, another question here. How important is it to know about product metrics to transition into the role? What sort of metrics do you generally use um, in the product manager role? Yeah, I, I think it's important to understand um, you know, probably some of your, your, your what a car should, and I'd probably call it some of your basic metrics. So we're talking from SaaS products, you know, um, understanding CAC, so what's, how much it costs you to acquire a customer, what are your churn rates, um, what are your LTV, uh, what do you like to have value of, of a customer? So I think understanding some of these basic metrics, again, this comes back to, for me, it's demonstrating that you, you have a base level understanding of, of how product management works. If you're reading any of the Marty Kagan books, you know, Build Products at Delight, I think it's called, um, you know, he'll talk about, you know, some of these base metrics. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a guy called Nathan Latka. Um, if you're not on Nathan Latka's podcast or getting his emails, jump on those. He's got YouTube clips um, where he talks about metrics specifically. Um, he talks about the chasm and the gaps. Um, so they're, they're things that, you know, if this is where you're wanting to go, just understanding these things because it makes because then the decisions that you're making as a product manager you understand how they're in, informing these metrics knowing the metrics is one thing but then understanding how the, the decisions you make impact each of these metrics i think it's really important great advice probably for even people who are currently in their product management roles as well yes, um, <laughs> <laughs> um simon do you have an example of how you can show you are solving um the problem in a resume. Maybe any yeah. recent examples that you've seen where people have really demonstrated that problem solving skill. Um, I think yes, I've, yes, I've I've interviewed um, product managers who've moved into roles where they've acquired a, a product, um, and or inherited a product. Sorry, and they've you know they've pr probably been given you know in, within six months we'd like these metrics you know moved one way or the other, uh, whether it's, you know, reducing churn, reducing CAC, and increasing LTV. Um, so, I, you know, I think, you know, for those people, for the one I'm thinking of specifically, you know, talked about very specific actions that you undertook to look at those metrics. A lot of those were um, around collaborating with teams, um, so engineering teams with product marketing to understand what's the product marketing spend, where are we spending it, why is it costing us this much to acquire a customer? You know, this, this amount seems inordinately high. What are we doing? Spending a lot of time with the product marketing team and then thinking about different ways to acquire customers. Um, so, you know, I think, um, again, it just comes back to, you know, what, understanding what are the problems that need solving and then taking this very measured approach to, to how we're going to uncover what the actual problems are. Great. Um as Sim has just said, thanks for the great presentation, Simon. Um, and we have another question from Johan. Um, where do you see product management as a discipline heading in the next few years? And I guess this can be for yourself and Akasha, if you feel mm. like you want to contribute, it'd be great as well. Yeah, um, I think that for more traditional businesses um, that have been bricks and mortar, um, moving into building their, their first digital products, um, I think we'll see this transition and I was talking, I've been talking about government a lot. I think we're going to see government building products, um, for, for, for communities. So I, th I think we're going to see, um, products that are not necessarily financially driven, um, but they're more service driven. Um, I think that's one thing. Um, I think we've seen banks in the last couple of years, really um, develop a, a sort of consumer focus around the products that they deliver. A lot of consumer marketing um, driving that. I think we're going to see superannuation and wealth management, particularly off the back of what we're going through at the moment. I think we're going to see superannuation really go down a similar path um, with the changes to the super in industry over the last couple of years, these uh, federally mandated changes. Um, I think for, for those super funds, they're... Up until relatively recently, you know, um, being if you're a teacher, you'd be encouraged to go into the teacher's you know, superannuation fund. I don't know what it's called, but I'm sure they have one. It's one of those ones. Um, 
and and they'd say, hey, we're all teachers and we're four teachers, so you should be with us. Um, and you know, there's, there was this mindset that we're, we're all in this together. We all do the same thing. So that's the fun we should be with. I think that now it's easier to roll in and out of super. Um, you know, where you where you invest your money, you know, can now be a decision like, what are the businesses that this super fund invests in? So there there are super funds now that are purely green. They only invest in in green businesses or B Corp businesses. There's um, super fund, I think, Spaceship that only invests in technology companies. So you know, we now have the ability to choose where we, our super goes. So those funds now need to change the way that they promote themselves, the products they offer, and that's where I see that them intersecting with wealth management um, businesses now. Um, it's interesting, I think, where we're in at the moment um, with the, this, this weird world we're living in right now, I think there's, there's probably a whole bunch of people out there who are, who are living week to week, paycheck to paycheck, that, that once we come out of this might say to themselves, we're not doing that again. Now, how do we get better at managing our money? So I think there's opportunity there for, for some of these super and wealth management businesses. So I think they'll take more of a product approach. That was a very long answer to a very short question. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think that's where they're going to go. Great. Akasha, did you have, want to add anything? Yeah, I definitely echo um, Simon's sentiments, uh, particularly with um, dirty jobs coming online. So around construction, sanitization, I think there'll be real growth in the SaaS space for that. Um, I also think there'll be a rise in focus on value-driven product development and ethics in the tech space. I think we, we rode the wave where tech was going to solve everyone's problems and embrace tech, love tech. Um, we're currently in a bit of a dip where we're seeing the negative impacts of tech um, around people saying that, that Facebook has attacked democracy, that kind of thing. And I, I really think there will be um, growth in that space for people from a philosophy background or an ethics background to, to really make an impact on the tech space. Um, the third trend I'm looking out for is the consumerization of B2B products. So you're seeing really successful IPOs from companies like um, Slack and Zoom who have really focused on the user experience and creating a really joyful, happy product, even though it's a traditional B2B product. Great, thank you, awesome. Yeah, I think definitely we're seeing a lot of changes in the market um, given the, the current COVID-19 um, situation. So I think um, watching the market trends carefully is great advice. Um, another question, this one's a bit of a cheeky one. Um, how, does, how do I beat the ATS and get you to read my resume, Simon? <laughs> Buy my email address and email it to me directly. <laughs> there you go, that's an easy one. <laughs> Um, hi Simon, what's the difference between a product designer and a product manager in your eyes? Um, yep, um, so product designer um, for me doesn't necessarily get involved in, in, in the marketing so much, the, the metrics, more in, interested in, in how, and Zendesk is a great example of this, I, I had the, the joy of hiring a few of Akasha's uh, colleagues in the product design team at Zendesk. Um, you know, Zendesk, one of Zendesk's, um, as they describe their business, beautifully simple software. Um, so the designers at Zendesk, I know, are, are comp they have their own design ethos um, around how products should feel and how users should interact with them. You know, this very minimalist um, approach to them. Um, for me, the, the, the product manager is taking probably more of the, the, the high level looking at multiple facets to the, of the product and the product designer is, is, is working in with, you know, the look, the feel, the flow, the usability, probably thinking about future, um, you know, they're, they're going to have a view over the, the, the product runway. So getting a, a view on, on how we can integrate stuff that we know is coming down the pipeline from a, from an extensibility perspective. Um, so if you, if you're a UX designer, transitioning to product design should be relatively straightforward. Um, if you're thinking of getting into product design from something else, totally doable. Um, I don't know of that many product design courses. I mean, I think you know if you if you wanted to do a, a you know a um, academy XI or or a GA course in in UX, then do that. Um, but I think you know, for me, UX is probably I think of UX more of um, you know more website development, sort of ecom that side of things. Whereas product is more than 
the usability of, of the product from start to finish, if that makes sense. Great. Um, we have another question from, and excuse me if my pronunciation is not great, from um, Daruv. Um, for someone not in a customer facing role, how can one develop user empathy and learn how to get into users' heads? Cool. Um, it, it's a tricky one. You could go and do it, get a degree in psychology, or you could um, you could think about your three favorite products, you know, super simple exercise. Think about your three favorite products that you use and list all the reasons that, that you love using them. Now, why, what are the things that you love about that product? What are the things that really irk you? So my favorite product is Shazam. And the reason I love it is I hit the button on my phone and it just starts working. I, I'm a bit slow. I, I don't even have to think about it. I just hit and it, it just works. I don't have to log in. I don't have to do a whole bunch of stuff. I love it. Sometimes it stalls on me. And it's, it's a little bit like when you go to McDonald's and you, you stand there queuing up for ages and you think I should have a salad, but I'm not going to, I'm going to have a burger. Um, and you go and order a burger and the person behind the counter says, that'll take three minutes. Yeah, it's a three minute wait. And that's the first thing you do, you go, oh, God, so you have a bit of a whinge to yourself, you pay your money anyway. And, and I think it's important to realize that when you go to McDonald's, you're not, you're not going for the burger, usually. Um, you're going for the time because it, we, know it, we know it's quick. So the minute it's not quick and we've got to wait three whole minutes, <sighs> You know, our expectations of that product change. I think it's the same with, with a lot of digital products. Um, you know, we have an expectation of, of, of what we want products to do. Um, so, again, very long answer to a very short question. What are, what are the products you love using? What do you love about them? What really irks you? Um, and then if you're applying for a role with the cash at Zendesk and you knew what product you're going to be working on, get a free trial of the product. Start understanding what, what's really easy to use what's not if you were the product manager what would you change um what conversations would you drive with users awesome and so, um, we have a few questions around which nathan you meant um just want to confirm it was nathan bush that you yeah. meant in terms of product metrics nathan latka l-a-t-k-a there we go thank you i think akasha wanted to throw some Natasha down there. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no sorry. Uh, just to build on what Simon was saying, um, you can also, it sounds a bit weird, but you can start interviewing your family and friends. So have conversations like, Nana, why do you have your tea in this pretty teacup instead of the big coffee mug? What do you like about it? What would make it better? Um, another good resource is there's some really active um, product management Facebook communities um, that can really help you. So I've seen people post like, hey, everyone, I'm looking to interview people about Spotify. Um, do you have 15 minutes to tell me about your experience, that kind of thing? So you can practice digitally and you can practice on your family and friends to, to really build up that user empathy and that skill for, for interviewing. Yeah. And I, I was just going to pop in there as well. One of the things that I've done in the past or have worked uh, on my team um, who aren't customer facing is um, just taking the opportunity to observe. So very similar to or separate to interviewing but you can just um you know go down to a food court or go to down to a shopping center and just sit down and just observe how people interact with either different people or different shops or attendants and you can kind of just see how people are behaving in different situations i think that's also um can be a good way to kind of understand that interaction point and you know how users um really operate i guess in that particular situation. Yep, I agree. Awesome. Just don't be so, creepy. <laughs> yes, just don't be creepy. <laughs> Sit down there and don't. <laughs> Sit down, madam. Just take some notes quietly. <laughs> so we'll probably just go through a few more questions um, before we wrap up. Um, so, um, and you can upvote for questions um, in the Q and A as well, just by liking them. So that will help us to prioritize the last one. So the next one is from um, Alexis. Thanks for the super practical advice, Simon. Um, a question around portfolios. So how do you show your value as a product manager without just showing the end result, um, which was the function of your team's hard work, the resources you, and the resources you had at your disposal? Yeah, uh, I think it's showing your, your, your thinking and your process. You know, what did you test? Why did you go this way instead of that way? What decisions did you make? 
um, you know, how did you collaborate on deciding which way to go with what? How many users did you speak to? You know, it's, I think it's showing your process. And, and coming back to Akasha's point, what, what went wrong? You know, what did you fail on? What did you all go, yes, the data tells us this and that's what we're doing. Oh no, that's not right. So we pivoted and we did something else. You know, um, we talk about the three Ps, you know, the three Ps, persevere, perish and pivot. You know, what, when have you had to kill a, kill a, a product? It's just not working. You know, to me, if I interview a product manager and they say, we, we had to kill it because these metrics told us we should, I want to talk to that guy or girl more because you know, they're, they're thinking about things the right way. You know, I think it's very, I think for project managers, it's really brave to kill a project. And I think for product managers, it's really brave and the right thing to do to kill a product. Completely agree. Awesome. Um, there's not enough systems or products that are put to rest in this world. So <laughs> having, I'm sure we've all inherited one of them that needs to die. <laughs> Um, great. What are the further career paths for a product manager? Um, I think they're kind of endless. You, know, you can go from, you know, startup world to um, global SaaS powerhouse like Akasha. Yeah. You know? um, I've got a friend who's you know, moved over to um, moved over to LA and uh, is now working at Apple. Um, and he was at, he was at SunCorp here um, for you know working on products for for, for a bank. Uh, for about three or four years um it's now apple um you know it can it's like it, it's like anything in life you can go wherever you want to you just got to own it if you're if you want to be the, the cpo of uber not that you want to but if you want if that was your thing then you can do it probably not going to happen tomorrow but you could do it you can go wherever you want great and we might just take one last question um for mid-career professional transitioning into a product management role, uh, would companies hire them at a lateral level in product management? Um, if you could demonstrate, for me, if you could demonstrate your ability to, to, to make an impact, to, to shift a needle, um, potentially, yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Simon. Really think it's been a really unique perspective that you've brought to um, to Product Tank this week, um, this month, sorry. And likewise to Akasha, I think that um, it's really great and I think it's great timing for people at the moment to really be thinking we can, amid this crisis, hopefully we all have a little bit of reflection time to think about, I guess, when this is all over, where will our careers take us and, and what work can we be doing in the meantime? Um, so thank you very much, really appreciate it. Um, one bonus from this crisis is that um, we now have a lot of content available through the Mind the Product community. So for those of you who are new to, to Product Tank, we're part of um, a global community that includes Mind the Product conferences. And unfortunately, the Singapore conference was um, cancelled, um, which is supposed to be happening um, in March. However, a lot of that content has been made available for free. So I'll share the link in the chat um, with those of you who um, are interested. Um, and I think there'll be a session, at least one session daily, plus lots of talks and things that people can also dial into. So if you've got a bit of time, it's a great place to learn and pick up some um, extra tips um, um, in the next coming weeks. And I imagine the um, San Francisco um, conference that was scheduled for June maybe in a similar situation so definitely check out that content. Um, we have a few other questions around books um, recommendations and things so feel free what we might do is move those questions into um, the meetup um, comments group um, and that way Emily and myself um, or anyone else can sort of share there but I think that's a great place for us to connect um, when we're not in a video call. Um, but yeah, does anyone have anything they want to add? Yeah. I was just going to, as a reminder, we did record the session as well. So if you do want to play it back, we'll make sure that we post that into the meetup um, as well. Just so you, if you want to listen back. Great. I gave, I gave all my, um, my customers this book recently. Um, it's called An Elegant Puzzle. It's more engineering focused, but there's some, some really interesting um, product stuff in there as well. An Elegant Puzzle, it's called systems of engineering management. Um, not directly product related, but there's some interesting stuff in there. It's got a nice cover.
Awesome. Um, Marty Kagan's book, Inspired, um, for those of you who are on the Women in um, Product um, meetup last Friday, he actually did a Q&A, but his book, Inspired, is an awesome, it's a bit of a Bible for product managers, um, and it's a real no, um, no holds barred reality check for how hard it is to be a product manager, um, which is great. Um, there was another comment about difference between um, product managers and product owners. Um, Melissa Perry has done an excellent article on the differences between a role of a product owner versus product manager, except for split role. So there's a few other things that people can look out for. Great. So our next event will likely be held in May around World, World Product Day. Um, we're lining up speakers at, as we at the moment um, and very likely it will be a virtual event so um, great that everyone could attend today and awesome that we can keep connected um, if you have any feedback um, please feel free to, to put it in the um, the comments as well um, we may even send a, a survey to get your feedback on how today went for everyone all the participants that joined Excellent. so thanks everyone thank you all thanks, thanks guys for the see ya Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Have a great night. Stay safe, everyone.